Salve Regina, Mater Misericordiae, Vita Dulcero, et spes nostra salve. Jesus in today's gospel likens his second coming in the glory of the fullness of the kingdom of God at the end of the world to a great man who having entrusted his goods to his servants finally returns after a long, long journey. In this story, this parable that Jesus gives, it is clear that the master was expected to return, but his servants didn't know when. In the interim, they were to invest wisely what he had committed to their charge and care. When he does return, they are called to account and rewarded or condemned according to what they have done or not done with the gifts he gave them. Those who acted wisely and used his gifts to increase their value are commended and hear from his lips Enter the joy of your Lord, which is the way in this parable Jesus describes entering the joy and happiness of heaven. But for the servant who did not, or more accurately, would not use his gifts to increase their value, there comes severe judgment, and he is cast into a place of outer darkness where there is the wailing and grinding of teeth which in this story is clearly our Lord's description of the horrors of hell, being separated from God forever. We often interpret this parable as dealing with our personal talents, personal gifts, or our time and treasure, and for obvious reasons, rightly so. It does indeed have this application. But underlying these obvious talents and gifts, if we have been baptized to each of us without exception has been given something exceeding the value of all these things, above the value of gold, silver, and precious gems, above the value of our personal gifts, however many they may be. And in fact, if we do not increase the value of this gift, all the others, however much improved and utilized, will be in the light of eternity of little worth. So it behooves us to ask, what is that gift, that one gift that leavens the whole? And the answer is that that gift is the supernatural grace of the theological virtue of faith, which is infused into the soul by means of baptism and which orients the soul to and is inseparable from the deposit of faith, the dogmas and moral principles of the Catholic Church, which in this sacred union brings the virtue of faith to fruition. It is this life of the obedience of faith, nurtured and sustained by the Holy Eucharist, that makes us, as the Apostle Paul teaches, children of light, and children of the day. If we nurture this grace of faith, this theological virtue, sustained and guided by the deposit of faith in our personal lives, we then sleep not as the rest do, but stay alert and sober. And it is for this composite yet singular gift, which understood correctly as faith working through love, that we, on the day of judgment, shall most certainly give an account. Some years ago, during an election cycle, when I was at St. Peter the Apostle Parish, I preached a homily encouraging parishioners to vote their Catholic faith, just as I have done here, the appropriate time. I received a letter from a brother priest in response to my homily in which I was informed that, quote, the authentic Catholic tradition is to inspire people to make their own personal choice based on their own internalized values, end quote. Of course, that plays well 
in our contemporary context. Do you realize, can you not see that if this de definition of Catholic tradition and its proper role in our lives were true, then Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Mao Zedong, Ben Laden, and others of like infamy would have been, by that definition, faithful Catholics. Taking exception to this definition, which in its incompleteness and ambiguity fosters subjectivism and relativism, I replied, the authentic Catholic tradition calls each of us to form our souls, our hearts, and our minds by the dogmas and moral principles of our Catholic faith, and then, having internalized these values, followed by the grace of God, the dictates of our conscience. The difference between these two definitions is the difference between a conscience which has no point of reckoning but the isolated self, the drift in a sea of relativism, and on the other hand, a conscience which, amidst the currents and treacherous tides of the present, is guided by the mighty lighthouse of the dogmas and moral principles of our Catholic faith. The divine gift of the virtue of faith, being the wind in our sails, as it were, is thus guided to safe harbor by the glorious light streaming from the lighthouse of our Catholic faith amidst the stormy and oft-times treacherous seas of this present life. We should indeed, as my priestly friend pointed out, follow our consciences unquestionably. But we should do so empowered by a sacramental life of sanctifying grace, having formed our consciences, our minds, our hearts, our intellects, by the dogmas and moral principles of our Catholic faith. Which of these two approaches do you think, continuing the metaphor, has a better chance of enabling you to make harbor, of hearing the blessed words, enter the joy of your Lord, which is to have reached the happiness, the light, and the glory of heaven. The holy sacrifice of the Mass is where all of this comes together. For here our Lord perpetually makes present his sacrifice of Calvary upon the cross, the font of the sacramental life of sanctifying grace which flows from his wounded side. There is great mystery here at last, as we profess in the Mass, the mystery of faith, truly beyond our comprehension. But what we can comprehend indeed, what even a child can know, is whom we receive in this blessed sacrament of the altar. And that is Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life, the author and the finisher of our faith. And we receive him that we might form our souls, our hearts, and our minds by the glorious content of our Catholic faith, and then, having internalized these truths, followed by the grace of the sacrament of God's love, the dictates of our conscience, which will, by God's grace, step by step, lead us to heaven. So, this being true, if today was that day you were called to give an account for your life, what account would you be able to give to your master, Jesus Christ, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, for the great gift of faith lavished, bestowed upon you through your baptism? From a different angle, what have you been doing? And what are you doing to nurture both the theological virtue of faith and the deposit of faith, the dogmas and moral principles of the Catholic Church in your own personal life? Perhaps you would respond as many do. Oh, here he goes again. You know, one more thing to do. There just aren't enough hours in a day. And I respond by saying, is that really the tact you're going to take? In truth, 
These hours in a day, in all the days of our lives, are the only hours we are given. And when they are gone, they are gone forever. And then the die is cast forever. The insipid plea that there weren't enough hours will ring hollow before the judgment seat of Christ, who pierces the very depths of our beings with his eyes and who grants each beat of our hearts in every hour of our lives. So probing a little further, let me ask, how many hours in a week do you spend in front of a television? Apart from work, how many hours do you spend in front of a computer or with some electronic device entertaining and occupying yourself? When is the last time you took time to read from your Catholic Bible? Or to read a book about your faith, by which I mean the Catholic faith, not some Protestant book? When, for instance, was the last time you investigated, studied, some aspect of your faith in the Catechism, a gift of inestimable worth that has been with us now for over 20 years. When did you last take the time to be alone with God, opening your heart and life to Him in quiet, personal communion and loving adoration? The Catholic faith the faith of your baptism centered in the holy sacrifice of the Mass is quite literally of infinite depth. It cannot be comprehended, but it can be apprehended, and that by degrees, but only if it is studied with patience and perseverance in the prayerful presence of its author. And this, I assure you, is time well spent. It pays dividends, eternal dividends. If you are not being proactive in this matter of your faith, you are burying this treasure given to you. And you are consequently adrift, swept by the winds and the currents of our contemporary culture, struggling to find a sure point of reckoning to no avail. Your immortal soul is in grave danger. But if you are pursuing your faith, with your heart, your mind, and life grounded in the holy sacrifice of the Mass, you, my friend, are being a wise and faithful servant. This and this alone will assist you in making the harbor of the happiness of heaven, where you will one day hear those blessed words from the lips of your Savior and your Judge. Enter the joy of your Lord, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. This is to return the talent, the gift of faith with interest to your Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.